Thank you very much, Dr. Desul. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you today about a relatively rare syndrome, which some of you may or may not have seen, and some of you may, not, may or may not care about, but you should, because this is the form fruit, this is the, uh, the ultimate extreme of what's actually happening in obesity in general. So by understanding this syndrome, we can understand general obesity. So I will uh, try to pull the two together for you. In order to understand obesity, first you have to understand the first law of thermodynamics. And I'm sure everyone in this room knows the first law of thermodynamics and thinks they understand it. I'm here to tell you you don't. The law states the total energy inside a closed system remains constant. We'll all agree with that. I agree with that, too. If you don't like it, you can take it up with Sir Isaac Newton. But there are two interpretations to that law. Here's the first. If you eat it, you better burn it, or you're going to store it. Now, who here believes that? Oh, come on, you all do. <laughs> Get with it, okay? In fact, if you believe that, then obesity is the result of two aberrant behaviors, gluttony and sloth. And indeed, that's why the federal government, that's why the insurance companies subscribe to this hashing of the first law, because then it becomes your fault and they can choose not to pay. So the question is, is this the case? I'm going to prove to you it's not. If you believe that, though, obesity is a behavior. Okay, so what's the definition of a behavior? Here it is. A stereotyped motor response to a physiological stimulus. So let's take that apart. Stereotyped, same every time. So yes, eating is a behavior because it looks the same every time you do it. Motor, muscles have to move. A thought is not a behavior. And finally, physiological. And that's what I'm interested in. What are the physiological underpinnings behind gluttony and sloth? What actually makes that happen? Now, with the advent of leptin in 1994, and we recognize that there was actually a biochemical reason for abnormalities in weight gain, obesity became a disease. Okay? And that was actually very important because at that point in time, in 2004 in the United States, when our Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, declared that obesity was a disease, that allowed Medicare to pay for obesity services. So you can see that these definitions actually have major implications. Well, I'm here to tell you that neither of these are true, that obesity is actually a phenotype of many different pathologies. There are a lot of ways to get to obesity. I told you about one of them earlier this morning. I'm here to tell you about a different one now. And here it is. So this is a boy who at age seven was perfectly normal weight for height, and then he developed a hypothalamic chiasmatic astrocytoma, a goomba sitting right in the middle of that energy balance pathway that Dr. Proieto first told you about this morning. He required surgery, he required radiation, he developed panhypopituitarism and diabetes insipidus, and he started gaining weight at the rate of 30 pounds per year ad nauseum, ad infinitum over the next eight years to his current weight here of 164 kilos. And this was a good kid with a good mom who tried very hard to do something about this kid's weight and nothing could be done. This form of intractable obesity after CNS insult is known as hypothalamic obesity because we know that something happened to the hypothalamus. It's first uh, discovered, uh, first uh, uh, written up by doctors Freelich and Babinski back in 1901. Dr. Bray took one, uh, eight of these children in 1975, admitted him to his clinical research center at UCLA Harbor uh, uh, for a month, okay, and threw away the key and fed these kids 500 calories a day for a month. Anybody want to guess what happened to their weight on 500 calories a day? Went up. Went up. How can it go up on 500 calories a day? But it did. And it's not because people were sneaking food in for them. Okay? It went up. So you have to think about the fact that these kids would rather store energy than burn it. And now how does your biochemistry allow you to do that? That's what today is about. In fact, there is a huge literature on the incidence of obesity in survivors of cancer, mostly of ALL. Um, here are five different uh, studies, some of which were done at St. Jude, where I used to work, where I first had to take care of these patients. And when you do the analysis on this, it turns out it's not the glucocorticoids, it's the cranial radiation. The cranial radiation is the thing that drives the excess weight. 
We looked at our St. Jude alumni based on various different uh, parameters, bone marrow transplant, non-malignant disease, solid tumors, ALL without radiation, other leukemias, ALL with radiation and CNS tumors, and the group that was the, high, the highest BMI ultimately were those who had some sort of CNS damage. We then took the patients who had the CNS tumors and divided them up by location, and it turned out that the group that had hypothalamic and thalamic location were the most affected. So again, documenting the fact, the role of the hypothalamus in the regulation of energy balance. This study also came out, this was a telephone study uh, called the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study that's run in the United States, and basically came up with the exact same story, cranial radiation being the big deal. This is also true in adults. So this is a study done by Jonathan Pinckney's group in Liverpool, England. Here's the histogram of the BMI before treatment. Here's the histogram of the BMI after treatment showing the rightward swing. So bottom line, damage to the hypothalamus, get fat. Now, the question is, why do you get fat? Is it because you eat more? No, it turns out not. This was a study done by Hermann Mueller. This is the craniopharyngioma database. The entire country of Germany is one craniopharyngioma database. And what they showed was that here's intracellular and hypothalamic craniopharyngioma for food intake, and here's healthy obese controls. Notice no difference in food intake. But here's the level of exercise, the level of activity using an accelerometer. This is healthy controls, and here's the patients with craniopharyngioma. These kids don't move. These kids do not move. In fact, it's the thing that the parents complain most about with these kids. You treat their diabetes insipidus, you treat their hypopituitarism, you give them hormonal replacement therapy, and they tell you that they've lost their child to the tumor, that the child is dead in their eyes, that there's nothing that, that makes this child interested in anything. They, eat on, they, they uh, sit on the couch, eat Doritos, and sleep because they don't move. Now, to understand what's happening with these children, we do have to understand this negative feedback pathway of energy balance. And Dr. Proietto showed you a different view of this, and I totally disagree with that diagram. It's not Dr. Proietto, so I don't blame you, okay? Because that diagram that he showed you before only had the afferents into the brain. It had nothing about the efferents out of the brain. And the efferents are equally important, maybe even more important. So let's do it a little differently now. Here are those same four hormones that Dr. Proietto told you about. Leptin, insulin, ghrelin, PYY, and blue. The ghrelin and the PYY are alimentary hormones that convey information about hunger and satiety on a meal-to-meal -meal basis. Okay? Uh, ghrelin comes from the stomach. When your ghrelin levels are high, you're hungry. Food, you, know, the, you put food in the stomach, ghrelin goes down, you're less hungry. Peptide YY3 to 36 is an alimentary hormone. At the end of the distal intestine, the L cells that make GLP-1 also make PYY. The problem is there are 22 feet of intestine you have to get through. So when you put the food in the stomach, it takes time. Give the kid 15 minutes to get the food to the distal intestine before they get their second portions so that they can get their satiety signal. So th these are alimentary afferents that tell the brain what's going on in terms of meal-to-meal -meal regulation. And over here we have leptin and insulin. Now leptin is the adiposity hormone that Dr. Proietto told you about. It is a hormone that basically tells your brain, hey, I have enough energy on board to engage in normal metabolic processes. I can burn energy at the rate of identity, which is 50 calories per kilo fat-free mass. I can engage in normal expensive metabolic processes, such as puberty and pregnancy. When your leptin levels are low, you can't do those things. When your leptin can't get to the brain, when you can't signal transduce, you can't do those things. That's what the OB mouse and the DB mouse show us. And it's also what the leptin deficient patients show us. Then we have this one over here called insulin. Insulin is really interesting because you'll notice that insulin is part of the efferin pathway telling the adipocyte what to do. It's also telling the hypothalamus what to do. It's both. So insulin tells your brain, hey, I'm in the middle of metabolizing a meal. I don't need to eat any more. So when your insulin goes up, that's part of the satiety signal as well that cuts your total food intake. All of this information, these four hormones, are being trans that information is being transduced at the level of the hypothalamus, the ventromedial hypothalamus, where the, uh, where the uh, leptin receptors and insulin receptors reside. 
And then that information is then transduced for, through a gated neural circuit to the paraventricular and the lateral hypothalamic areas where the melanocortin-4 receptors reside. And that tr uh, uh, translates into either anorexigenesis, that is, I'm not hungry and I can burn, or orexigenesis, I am hungry and I'm not going to burn. I'm going to store and I'm going to take on more, or I'm going to burn and not feel bad doing it. Then that information, now comes the efferent pathway. That information then comes down either to the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Dr. Proieto's uh, figure only had the nucleus tractus solitarius. The motor portion of the vagus tells the pancreas to make extra insulin. And you'll see why that's important in just a moment. In addition, you have the adrenergic system that comes from the locus ceruleus, which then goes to the adipocytes and through the beta-3 adrenergic receptor causes lipolysis. So this is the yin-yang of energy balance. Fat burning through the sympathetic nervous system or fat storing through the vagal system. That simple. And so by the leptin going up, the brain then transduces that information when it can see it. In order to understand how this works in hypothalamic obesity and indeed in any obesity, we have to understand what happens when you don't get the leptin signal. Easiest way? the starvation response. So here's my OB mouse. Okay, it must be the brother of your OB mouse, but I can't know because of the HIPAA regulations. <laughs> okay, in order to understand this, let's show you what happens when you try to lose weight. This is the original redux or dexfenflurmine study. Notice, look what happens. Weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. Four months, that's it, finished, no more. Why? Did the patient stop taking it? Did it stop working? I promise you the patients took it, okay? If it worked, they were taking it. Negative plateau. Here's sibutramine. Four months, that's it, finished, no more. And here's Orlistat, fat blocker. 20 weeks, four months, no more. In every case, four months of weight loss and then that's it. Did the patient stop taking it? Did it stop working? What's happening? There's a negative plateau. What's that negative plateau? Well, it turns out your body is smarter than you are because it knows to reduce your energy expenditure commensurate with the change in energy intake. Dr. Proieta did tell you about that. Indeed, the body is trying to defend its current caloric content. That's right. But through what mechanism? Well, one, defective, it reduces what's known as non-exercise-associated thermogenesis, also known as NEAT, also known as fidgeting. Have you ever seen an obese kid fidget? Doesn't happen. Okay? How about, and also there's decreased resting energy expenditure. So that's the thermic effect of food and also reduction in uncoupling proteins because of a reduction in sympathetic tone reducing PGC1-alpha, which is in charge of uncoupling proteins. So therefore, you burn less heat. This is also the same study that Dr. Proieto showed you, Rudy Leibel's data from Rockefeller. And I actually worked on these patients when I was at Rockefeller. So I know the name of this guy. I know the name of this guy. But I can't tell you. So this is the 50 calorie per kilo fat-free mass line right here. And you'll notice that when you gain 10%, you stay on the line. You still burn energy at the rate of 50 calories per kilo fat-free mass. However, when you lose 10 or 20%, you fall off the line you are now burning energy at the rate of 42 kilo calories per kilo fat-free mass. You have become 20% more energy efficient. That's why you stop losing weight. And it doesn't matter whether it's dietary restriction or any drug or, for that matter, bariatric surgery. You basically reduce your energy expenditure to meet your energy intake. Why? Now, in hypothalamic obesity, it's even worse. Because here's that same 50 calorie per kilo fat-free mass identity line for normal obese, simple obesity, and here's the line for hypothalamic obesity, much less. They are burning energy at a much lower rate, and that's why they're not moving. These kids can't burn energy. They are storing it. They would preferentially store it over burning it. And if you're storing it, you don't feel like exercising. And I would pose to you the following that energy expenditure is synonymous with quality of life. They're synonymous. Those things that make your energy expenditure go up, for instance, exercise, caffeine, ephedrine, make you feel good, right? 
Things that reduce your energy expenditure, like hypothyroidism or starvation, make you feel lousy. So how many calories you burn and how good you feel are the same thing. So when you diet, you burn less energy, how are you going to feel? Lousy and hungry. Now, in order to understand how this all works and how leptin plays a role, let's look at the autonomic nervous system and its role in adipocyte function. So here's the adipocyte making leptin. The leptin goes to the uh, hypothalamus, stimulates the sympathetic nervous system via the locus ceruleus to increase sympathetic tone. The sympathetic tone then travels back via the adrenergic efferents to uh, 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 interact with the beta-3 adrenergic receptor, thereby reducing, causing lipolysis, thereby reducing the amount of energy in the, uh, in the uh, adipocytes, causing lipolysis, going to the liver to turn to ketones, and also reducing your leptin, so you have a nice negative feedback pathway of leptin, the sympathetic nervous system, and body weight. So here, is, this is in a different schematized version. When leptin is sufficient, your hypothalamus senses energy sufficiency, activates the locus ceruleus, stimulates the intermedial cell column of the spinal cord, norepinephrine binds to the beta-3 receptor, and there's lipolysis right there. But that's not all that happens. Oh, sorry, let, before I go, I go to the next step. In hypothalamic obesity, kids with craniopharyngioma, for example, here's an insulin tolerance test that was done, and here's epinephrine. Notice, no epinephrine. Here's norepinephrine. Notice, no e norepinephrine. These kids' sympathetic tone are in the sewer. And the reason is because they're leptin-resistant. They can't see their leptin. They got loads of leptin. They're 164 kilos. Their leptins are it's in the sky high, but their brain can't see it because those neurons are dead. And so because they're leptin-resistant, organically leptin-resistant, they're in energy conservation mode and their sympathetic tone is way down and you can't even get it up with insulin-induced hypoglycemia. No wonder they don't move. This just shows uh, catecholamine metabolites in the urine. So here's BMI and here's HVA and you can see way lower and here's VMA and you can see way lower in the patients who have hypothalamic obesity. Okay, so here we are on the sympathetic side. Now let's add the vagal side. When leptin is sufficient, the hypothalamus senses it and says, you know what, I don't need to eat so much. It turns off the dorsal motor nucleus.